Hello everyone and welcome back to the Platypus Theatre at Pike Online 2021. I hope you had a roaring good time uh, during the lunch break and welcome back. Uh, first off, we've got Brianna Law who's talking about, so you're a software developer, now what? Exploring career growth. Brianna Law is the software test lead of a team of 10 and previously a software engineer at Planet Innovation, where she works on medical devices and embedded software with Python. She is a PyTest enthusiast, helped organize PyCon AU 2016 and 2017, and organized slash organizers uh, PyLadies Melbourne. Take it away. Ah, I forgot oh, to I mention, this is something. a pre-record. Yeah, yeah, you can say something <laughs> if you want. Um, so you're a software developer. Now what? Exploring career growth. Hi, everyone. I'm Brianna. Thanks for tuning in. I have a Google Doc with links and resources for this talk. And if you're part of the PyCon Australia audience, please head there to ask your questions too. I will put this link in the conference chat. Have you ever had a meeting with your manager where you felt like this? Where you know things are going okay at the moment, but you have no idea what to say about the future. Maybe where you want to be promoted, but you're not sure what it involves aside from being an expert programmer. Or maybe thinking about your career makes you feel a bit lost. Like programming is fine, but it doesn't thrill you that much. Sometimes it's such a struggle to get into this industry, to find a job that we like, that we forget to think about what happens after that first step. I wanna give you lots of ideas for how to think about and talk about where your career can go so that this time next year, you have a more fulfilling career. I've been working as a software developer for a few years now. I feel lucky to have had the chance to work in Python for most of those years. This is my sixth presentation at PyCon Australia. I've worked in small business, government, as a contractor. For the last five years, I've been at Planet Innovation, which is a design and manufacturing company for IoT and medical devices. Basically, it's an engineering consulting environment. And even five years ago, when I started at Planet Innovation, I had these same questions and doubts. Okay, I think I'm a decent programmer. So what's next? What should or could be next? I know that that can be a scary conversation to have with your boss. And now working as a manager, I'm on the other side of the table. And one of the things I most want to know is, what can I do that will help you feel motivated and fulfilled at work? If people in my team come to me with ideas and questions about their future, it's just about my favorite thing in the world. In this session, I wanna talk about career growth rather than progression. Getting a promotion or a more senior title is definitely part of the story, but there are other parts as well. I want to talk about a concept called product market fit and how you can apply this idea to thinking about your career. A big part of that is figuring out what actually interests or suits you and I'll share a couple of strategies to help figure that out. I'm going to focus on the company where you are right now for a couple of reasons. One is that you have great intel and access to it. You know the teams, the tech, the people, the office politics. Two, you are a trusted and known quantity. It's a lot easier to make a leap or a left turn under those conditions. We could apply this same process to a hypothetical new employer or the industry at large, but it will require a bit more work. And if you're in a toxic or dysfunctional workplace, then this does not apply. It's rarely worth trying to improve conditions from the bottom up, and your best bet is self-preservation by finding a new job. Before we get into it, I want to get some misconceptions out of the way so that we're thinking about our career with the right frame of mind. It's super easy to talk ourselves out of doing career planning. It's extra work and it might involve some difficult conversations. Give me a chance to convince you that it's worth doing. I've used these emojis to clarify what's the unhelpful framing and then what's the helpful framing. And if you like, you can think about them as the Drake meme. So first up, 
my career growth is my boss's responsibility. Nope. Your boss can obviously influence your career a lot. They can help or hinder, but they can only help if you set the direction. My friend Javier described this once as, when you have a job, you actually have two jobs. One is the obligation you have to the company, to the work that they ask you to do. The other is the obligation to yourself for your personal fulfillment or career. Chris Kent says in this tweet, I write my own career development plan. I learned quickly that if it was left to someone else, either it wouldn't happen or it wouldn't be relevant. On occasion, I can get my company's plan and my own to overlap. That's the sweet spot. That's the definition of fulfilling work. Second up is the idea that careers are for ambitious people. Now, maybe you think, I don't need to talk about my career. I'm not planning to be the next Steve Jobs. I don't want to work 80 hour weeks. I just want to do my work, take a nice paycheck, live my life. And if that's you, then good on you. I fully respect not centering your life around work. But I just want to ask, is there any chance that you're opting out of these conversations because they make you feel uncomfortable? Because these are not easy conversations. If you admit to yourself and your boss that you want something else, you're making yourself vulnerable. You are inviting scrutiny and opening up the possibility that they will say, no, you're not good enough. And that is really scary. But if you do like working in tech, thinking and talking about your career will help ensure that it is something that can hold your interest for three, four, five decades. If we're here for the long haul, it's worth making sure it's actually fulfilling. So let's talk about the idea of product market fit and how we can apply it to thinking about our career. Product market fit is an idea from startups where a company will typically interview early adopter or target customers and try to make sure that they are making a product that addresses a real need that people will pay for or use. It sometimes happens that business founders have brilliant ideas, but they don't always translate into brilliant, brilliantly successful products. And this process is about exploring customer drivers to try and make sure that when you do launch your product, it will be a commercial success. This is the Planet Innovation blurb about it. and we talk about these five stages, market exploration, in-depth interviews, bright innovation, concept testing, and then recommendations. So what would it look like if we apply this idea to our career? Let's try and formulate product market fit for your career. Product market fit for your career means having a great job that is valued and meets the needs of your employer. Considering product market fit early de-risks your career growth and increases the likelihood of your job being fulfilling and satisfying. So then our five stages might be, know my company. What does my company need? Know myself. What do I enjoy? What do I value? And how am I perceived? Brainstorming for synergy discussing some ideas with your trusted advisors. And then finally, agreeing on a plan with your manager. And you can adapt these a bit if this doesn't exactly fit your setup. If you're a freelancer, it won't be know my company, but more know my customers or know my niche. Agreeing on a plan doesn't even need to be with your manager. Maybe it's with a, a business partner or a peer. Let's dive in. So first up is market exploration, AKA, what does my company need? This whole question is about exploring the problem space, which in this context means focusing on understanding our company in depth and in detail before we think about exactly where we might fit in it. And the first thing to understand is what's the structure of my company? And even with that, there's a few aspects to consider. The first is, what is the formal structure, aka what does the org chart look like? It's good to look at that and think, do I know what all the teams do? 
do I understand how they make money or serve the business? And who are my contacts? The next aspect is the job ladder or career ladder. What are the titles and how does my company define them? Do I know what my current level is? Can I draw links between my achievements and the detailed description of my current or future roles? Some large companies have published their job ladders on a website called progression.fyi. If your company hasn't published their ladder internally, this is a very reasonable thing to ask about and discuss with your boss. And then I think it's worth thinking about what are the informal specialist roles that you can see in your team or department? Who are the go-to people for different topics? These people may have the same titles as everyone else, but they have developed a reputation for some area of expertise. In larger companies, there may actually be dedicated roles or even teams for some of these things, but I bet that within any given team or department, there are still informal roles at play. Once we have mapped out how things are, we can start thinking about what are the gaps. Can you see that your team is struggling to grasp new industry trends like machine learning, observability, eventing, data engineering, or even basic things like security, process, version control, or containers? Most teams, I would guess, struggle with at least one concept which is considered basic by industry at large. You don't need to be invested in a cutting edge trend to make a real difference to a team. So make a list of all these gaps, which could be potential opportunities. The second stage in our process is developer know thyself. And it's about knowing your own values and motivations and goals, as well as how you are perceived. And I wanna say right now that knowing yourself is not necessarily an easy thing. Most of us are not born with a vision or have a detailed 10 year plan. The idea of ask for what you want is all well and good, but it requires that you know what you want. So I want to suggest a couple of exercises that I think can help with figuring that out. But first, another mindset check. Career growth means becoming a perfect programmer. This is something that is really easy to think especially when there's so much emphasis on programming skills as the barrier to entry in job interviews, for example. But the truth is that your programming skills alone will only take you so far. Seniority is about impact. There are so many different ways to have an impact and your programming skills will only make up a small part of one of them. Even if you stay in the individual contributor pathway, what you choose to work on, prioritize and how you communicate about it can create a much bigger impact than your coding. So first I'm going to suggest that we do a bit of analysis of your career or different jobs to date. I think this is a good warm up because it's very concrete. You don't need to feel your true heart's desire. You just need to reflect on what you've already done. Mary Williams has a great talk called Career Vectors for Technical Leaders, and she identifies these six vectors that can apply to a role. Hands-on tech is about building things yourself, i.e. the essence of the individual contributor. Tech strategy is more about architecture work or making decisions like build versus buy. Delivery is about getting stuff done, planning, meeting deadlines, shipping. Organization management is your classic manager type work. Commercial thinking is about understanding budgeting and the financial model of the broader company. And domain depth is about knowing your industry or customer segment really well. And I like this so much because it immediately makes obvious that programming is only part of the picture. And I can take this spider diagram and then draw on what I think reflects my personal strengths at the moment and what is needed for my current role, which as I mentioned earlier is the software groups test lead. Straight away, any differences between the two are really obvious. 
So this shows that my current role is not fully utilizing my strengths in hands-on tech. And conversely, on the organization management side, that's a growth area for me. Will Larson is someone who has written about engineering management and careers, and I want to highlight a couple of his ideas. One is that it's not very helpful to think about all your time at one particular company as being all the same experience. Whether we change teams or management decisions come in suddenly, or even personal actions like having a baby, these can all mark a transition from a stable era to a rapid change period. When you first join a new company, it's almost certainly a rapid change period as you try to absorb the information and understand the organization's culture as well as tech. But if you think back to when you first joined your current workplace, once you found your feet, did you settle into a stable period or did other things happen that kept you in a rapid change period? Julia Evans has a blog post called how I learned to program in 10 years, where she kind of mapped this out across multiple jobs. You may not be able to read all the detail here, but you can get the point that there are periods where her learning pace dramatically increased and other periods where it was more flat. And Julia's totally unscientific learning graph is essentially the learning vector in Will Larson's work history chart, where he analyzes jobs he has had in terms of pace, people, prestige, profit, and learning. In this graph, Will has mapped out three of his jobs. I think the direction of the vectors doesn't mean anything. It's just about the length of them. So you can see, for example, the learning aspect in his first job was huge. The second job, not so much. And then the third job, it increased again. Pace is about working at a sustainable rate so that you can avoid burnout. People is about the relationships you develop with coworkers, essentially building your network. Prestige is something that makes getting your next job easier. And part of it is definitely working at a respected or reputable place. But Will makes the point that prestige is manufacturable through activities like writing a blog or a newsletter or talking at an event like this. And profit is pretty much your salary. I like this graph as a way of seeing that profit is not the only motivator, learning is not the only motivator. You can think about what combination of these factors have you enjoyed, uh, what combination are you experiencing at the moment, and what combination are you ready for next? So now you've warmed up a bit by reflecting on what you've already done. You can get to the tough questions. What do I want? Something I've found is that my brain doesn't always have an answer for me for this question. But if I ask some adjacent questions, I can start to move a bit closer. Some of the questions I might ask myself then are what feels scary or exciting? What makes me feel really gratified? What tasks do I tend to put off and really struggle to get done? Another good topic to think about is values. And this is probably more if you are considering a new job or maybe a new team. I really like the set from a website called Key Values, which aims to help companies and potential employees find culture fit, as loaded as that term is. What I like uh, the most about this is that many of these are not inherently good or bad. For example, a potential team value is wears many hats, which they describe as, Engineers have a broad set of responsibilities and can take on additional roles in addition to writing and pushing code. For some people, they would read that and be like, yes, I 100% want that. And others would be like, I 100% do not want that. And both of those are okay for both individuals and companies. But the main thing is that when you find a new job, you're finding that right fit for you. Finally, the last part of knowing ourselves is to know how we are perceived. And this is probably the scariest of all, asking for feedback 
trying to understand our reputation. To get the most out of this, you definitely need to have a relationship with some degree of trust. This doesn't need to be only your boss. Think about peers in or outside of your team you have worked with that you could ask as well. And this is a whole topic in itself that I don't have time to cover in detail. But one way to kick this off might be to share your career vectors spider diagram with your manager and see if they agree with it. Okay, time for brainstorming. Through all your reflections so far, you have probably had a lot of great ideas. One way to use them is what's called the double diamond, a classic design thinking concept. It describes four stages across two diamonds, both of which start with divergent thinking, which is essentially research and brainstorming before whittling those ideas down into a core one to focus on. And this looks kind of fancy, but really it just reminds us that brainstorming needs to be approached with an open mind, without an attachment to any particular outcome. And these two diamonds are often referred to as the problem space and the solution space. And I think that is an insight just by itself that is worth a lot. We've probably all on some occasion jumped to what we think the answer is before someone else has even finished asking their question. I know I have. It's a classic failure mode for engineers, both in conversation and debugging. Your brain races ahead trying to find an answer. But what we actually need to do is focus on the problem, on understanding it in a deep way. And in our case, all our research and reflection is forming that deep understanding. I'm not going to say a lot about exactly what form this brainstorming is going to take because it will depend so much on your personal situation, the thinking that you've done, the company that you're at, and the person that you are. But let me bring up a couple more misconceptions that can derail you before you start. One trap is the idea that there is one or maybe two career paths. And so when we think about software, the stereotypical role is the software developer. And there's also some managers. So maybe we have an individual contributor track and a management track. So that's two career paths, right? I really like this reply to the question, do you plan to retire from tech or are you planning on a second career? Tom Forsyth said, depending on how you count it, I'm on my fourth or sixth career. And this is a neat way of acknowledging the breadth of opportunities in software. It's not only industry and technology that define potential career paths. There are a huge number of roles where your programming skills and knowledge of software development will serve you well without being the primary focus. And let me spend a bit of time on this because for me, it's personal. As I mentioned, for the past two years, I've been the software group's test lead or test manager at Planet Innovation. It's certainly not a role that I ever thought about and I wouldn't have applied for such a job before working here. But once I was in the company, I saw the potential for the company and the potential for myself and the two married together really well. I will add a caveat here as well, especially for women and underrepresented minorities. If you move away from a core engineering type role too early, you have a risk of being typecast as not technical, and it may be difficult for you to move back later. It's pretty BS, but it does happen, so you need to consider how that could impact your options. Another limiting conclusion that our brain might reach is something like, I can't take a new path, my path is set. You might think, all my experience is in Python. I can't become a front-end developer. Or I'm a data analyst. I'm stuck with SQL and Power BI. I can't become a machine learning engineer. Or whatever it is. And luckily, these misconceptions have, al have already been covered in a previous PyCon Australia talk, Tom Eastman's 2018 keynote. He talks about the value of a growth mindset 
and how our ego interferes sometimes and stops us from trying something new. If we can keep in touch with the beginner's mind, it's one of the most important things to keep us learning throughout our career. When we think about the past, we might think about all the doors closed, all the paths we didn't take, and now we're on a set road. But the truth is, there's always a myriad of paths ahead of us. It's being able to overcome the discomfort of looking foolish and embracing learning that opens those paths. Okay, so we've been doing a lot of thinking and brainstorming. Now it's time to get a bit of a reality check by discussing our ideas with other people. But who should those other people be? One approach is to find a cabal, a group of friends who work in the industry, current or former colleagues, or maybe people that you meet on Slack or Discord, maybe people you meet at this very conference. A similar kind of idea is what Lara Hogan calls building a manager Voltron. This is especially helpful if something is missing from your relationship with your boss, but it's a good idea for anyone. I think of these people as more likely to be people that you've worked with, maybe leaders you admire or have rapport with in teams that aren't your immediate team. And even if you get on well with your boss, it's always good to be exposed to different leadership styles and perspectives. Last step, agree on a plan. While agreeing on a plan is important, hopefully going through this process involves talking to your manager along the way. Especially when you are figuring out the structure of your company, your boss likely has a broader perspective that will be very helpful. So here are some cheat codes to help you get started. Feel free to copy and paste these into the agenda for your next one-on-one. -on -one. And one last misconception, career planning means following the plan. Maybe it's a five year or a 10 year plan. You figure out a goal and work backwards. And if you don't end up achieving the goal, it means you failed, right? The truth is plans are nothing but planning is everything. We already know from our work that plans usually end up changing, but that doesn't mean that it was a waste of time to write down a plan, far from it. The process of creating the plan, which is the thinking, dreaming, talking and brainstorming is actually the important part. We know that the plan will change and we welcome that. So now we have a step-by-step -step process for talking about your career. And at the start, I said, I want you to have a more fulfilling career. Now, my question to you is, what's stopping you? Next week, have a better conversation about your career. And next year, have a better job. Your manager might be surprised. You might even surprise yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk, Brianna. That was so good. Oh, you're muted. Classic. Classic. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, it's the first time I've talked about this topic, so I've you know, was not sure how it's going to be received and I'm really keen to get feedback uh, from people. And so I do have in the Google Doc uh, a section where you can write some feedback, especially if it didn't, you know, hit the mark for you. I would love to hear a bit about maybe why you think that might be. And yes, I will join the hallway video chat too to continue the conversation. Yeah, um, we, we don't have time for questions uh, on video, but yes, as Brianna mentioned, uh, she's going to be in the hallway video chat too. You can also put questions into her Google Doc um, and you can continue typing about this in text in the uh, Platypus hallway chat. Um, next up we have a 15 minute uh, gap before the next talk, which is going to be Sam Bishop with Snakes All The Way Down Building Worlds With Python Code um, at 2.45 AEST. Thank you so much everyone.